Thanks, Christoph, um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just going to share my screen uh, from the slides. Oops, so that was OK. Let's go into OK. So that should be it. Um, so the title of my talk is Countdown to Scala 3. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very exciting uh, because we are uh, Scala 3 is suddenly pretty close, so we want to release it uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and there's not that much time and a lot of action to get there. So here is, is essentially a very short uh, snapshot to um, to give you where we are, who's working on it, uh, an increasing number of people are, and organizations are, work, are working on it, and essentially what are the areas that are un, uh, under activity and that, uh, that are currently under works and what is what is already done. So a uh, quick uh, reminder, why do why are we doing this exercise? Why Scala 3? Well, the goal for Scala 3 is really to work out the essence of Scala. When Scala was first released, that was a long time ago, 2004, um, we sort of, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the language uh, sort of was born out of inspiration, but that the foundations at the time were still missing. So that means that this idea to find a fusion of object-oriented and functional, very little was known about that. And uh, since then, uh, we have developed quite a lot of uh, foundations. Uh, so we have made very good progress. Uh, the first uh, cornerstone there was DOT, uh, the dependent object types calculus. Um, then uh, we had uh, other formalizations and foundations for the way we do implicits. So SI stands for simple implicits. Uh, and uh, then we also have now a much better understanding about metaprogramming. So these are all sort of research contributions where we essentially cleaned up our act and said, well, now what that the, these things with, that we're doing, they are uh, very interesting and powerful. But how can we uh, really uh, treat them as, as theories that we can prove things about, that we can prove soundness and safety and things like that? Uh, so that's what we did over the last decade or so. And uh, after these foundations, then it's good to circle back and say, well, with all that we've learned, uh, uh, would we have to change the language somewhere to essentially reflect better the, the, the now much better sort of foundations that we have? And uh, there, there were a couple of areas where we essentially uh, had to or wanted to do something. So that was essentially the... Uh, the starting point for Scala 3. Uh, and then once we decided to do a major and incompatible version, a version of the language, uh, we uh, then essentially we had a lot of other ideas how to improve things. Uh, the main perp the main point of uh, Im Im improvements really what we wanted to do was the tooling and the binary compatibility. And we're not done yet, but I believe the, the the, the the outlook is, is is looking good, and I think there will be a lot of positive developments in these areas. Um, we wanted to drop baggage, uh, things that essentially were seemed cool at the time and haven't haven't uh, st stood the test of time, like XML or symbol literals will be dropped in the language. Uh, we will be the language will become quite a bit more opinionated in essentially what is the right formatting of things and how to express yourself. Uh, a, a big point for me in particular was to make it more appealing and easy to use for beginners. Uh, we have good uh, experience with teaching, in particular with the Coursera MOOCs and also with teaching our students at EPFL. But I have uh, now noticed that I read, have redone these things that one can, can be uh, a lot simpler still than what, what current Scala is. So that's a big, big uh, push uh, for the language. Uh, it goes with that, that we want to eliminate pitfalls and traps and improve productivity and predictability. And in the end, uh, to just sum it up, we want to make it more feel natural and beautiful to use because, I mean, that's the the final ultimate goal, right? You want to enjoy what you do. You want to be find programming should be an enjoyable activity. And the language should, shouldn't get in the way, but help you formulate your thoughts. And I hope that Scala 3 will uh, be a, a good bit further down 
the road towards that goal uh, compared to what we have right now, which is, of course, also a very nice language and would be my language of choice if there wasn't Scala 3, which is essentially the next iteration in that journey. Okay, so the roadmap. Um, the So this year, we essentially uh, said we would uh, change the experimentation and really settle on a language that happened in spring uh, where we had all features fleshed out. And uh, I think in a bit later spring, like in May, with a, we, we stopped any variation. So uh, since then, we, we're essentially in feature freeze. So the, the, the feature set of Scala is now frozen and we, uh, we work on documentation, tooling uh, and uh, the uh, tutorials, basically. Uh, so documentation, specification, tooling. Um, in we had in uh, last in late August the last Dotty release. So uh, during all this time, the project was called Dotty. Uh, last Dotty release is zero twenty seven. We released one version every six weeks, and in uh, end of uh, September, early October, we we uh, plan to have the first Scala three zero release. So this is a good time to essentially um, uh, make a. Uh, take a step back and say where we are. So, end of beginning of October will be Scala 3.0 milestone one, and that will hopefully lead to uh, Scala 3.0 at least RC one in late 2020. Uh, if the RC process goes well, we might already have a final, but there's nothing one can promise at at, at this stage. But that's what we aim for. So, at least RC one in late 2020. Uh, so, what is part of that. Um, so there's quite a lot. Uh, we have to be developed a new compiler. Uh, that's uh, that's done, of course, uh, with a test suite. Uh, it comes with a repo. Uh, there's been a, a lot of work now on IDEs. Uh, we are working with Virtus Lab on, uh, or rather Virtus Lab is working with us because they are the leader of the project on, on metals, uh, VS Code and uh, uh, essentially the, the Scala plugin for VS Code, which um, uh, by now also supports Dotty. And I'm using that in my new courses. Uh, so I'm sort of the, the lab rat to try it out, but it's looking good. Um, and uh, IntelliJ, there's also effort underway to make that work uh, with Scala 3. Uh, the uh, metals already has worksheets, which is for me a very effective teaching device. So very important for me. Uh, there's build tool integration. So mill runs on Scala 3, SPT runs on Scala 3. We'll see how far we can get other build tools across, but I think that's the two major ones and they work on Scala 3 already. And we've been um, doing a lot of work again with Virtus Lab on the doc tool, which is based on our Essentially, it takes our internal tasty format and renders that using the Docker tool. Uh, there's a, quite a lot of libraries that are in train to be ported. Um, so uh, the main uh, relief is that we don't need to port uh, Scala 2.13 because we're compatible with it. Uh, the Scala 3 will consume Scala 2.13 binaries, including the standard library which of course is very important because if you want to migrate software from Scala 2 to 3, you don't want to migrate against a different library at the same time, one thing at a time. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we keep the library stable, but there will be some small 3.0 additions. Then there's something, uh, a, a fairly large new library called Tasty Reflect, which is essentially the new basis for metaprogramming. And then there are the community built libraries. Uh, so I, on the, on the right hand side here, you see a list of the projects that are currently built against every new Scala 3, uh, uh, pull request. So they are continuously tested. Uh, the, these libraries are, most of them are not yet published. So essentially that's internal tests only. Uh, but it's encouraging that they are, they all run under Scala 3. And uh, in due time, they, they will be published uh, for, for Scala 3. So what we count on is really the help of the community that we can upstream uh, fixes that make, make these things run under Scala 3. And that will essentially then 
hopefully um, uh, uh, the, the community, the, the, the originators, the providers of the, that library will then uh, hopefully do the cross -pub publishing between two and three. There's also a focused effort in all this to get the what I call the Singaporean stack ported. So essentially the Howie uh, set of libraries, including Ammonite. So there's now a concerted effort to, to get that done uh, involving several people. Uh, other big things that you see is the type level libraries. So type level also will, has essentially made a commitment to port their libraries. And you see quite a bit of others. Uh, so uh, let's see, there's better files. There's a quite interesting library that does uh, async CPS on Dotty. Uh, there's Zio, uh, there's, there's uh, Shapeless. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of things that are already ported. So this is encouraging. And then there's a docs. Uh, so there will be a Scala book uh, published on the web. Uh, that there's also a, an effort by, by many people. We'll get to that. Um, we are currently porting the, the online courses. Uh, so I'm re-recording the Coursera 1 and 2, uh, Principles of Programming and uh, uh, Program Design uh, courses. Um, with uh, essentially the new language and also some new material uh, to essentially show the new capabilities of the language. So we're going to treat uh, enums, extension methods, uh, the new givens instead of implicits, opaque types, and uh, these things. Uh, there's also a new MOOC in preparation called Effective Scala, which is a, a uh, essentially a, a fast track towards becoming productive in Scala, which is essentially more practical and less academic. Uh, and all these courses will use Scala 3 syntax, will be based on Scala 3. And then last but not least, uh, there's, uh, uh, we, there's a work to write a comprehensive migration guide that will help you to essentially get your software over to Scala 3. Um, the, there's, uh, the, the, the place to follow for all these developments is contributorscalalang.org. I'll switch over. So now you probably ask, well, uh, this looks like a lot of stuff. Who's who's working on this and who's doing that? So let me get to that next. Just have to uh, get another share. Okay. So um, Scala 3 is truly a community-powered release. The community has taken a great role in that. So it's not a single uh, company or team that, that pushes it out. It's really a, a large number of very heterogeneous people. So here the logo, I really like the logo because it shows sort of the transition from Dotty uh, to Scala. So Scala is a, a solid red and Dotty, of course, are the dots in, in, in there. So that's where we currently, we're currently probably at the second ring here. So the dots are fading out and we're becoming more and more solid. So the task ahead of us is then we still need to finalize 52 projects with uh, less than 20 people spread over four organizations and co coordinate the community investment. So it's a big task, but uh, the, I think it's, it's a very exciting time to, to do these things and people are super motivated to do that. So what we focused on was uh, language features. Uh, that's mostly done. Like I said, we, we are in a feature freeze. So I think uh, there's not, not that much that will come, but we will uh, essentially still need to, uh, concentrate on the f exact specifications and also the docs. The, the focus right now is really on the tools, not just the compiler, but the more, more the, the, the IDEs, the doc tool, uh, the uh, build tool integration, and so on. And the focus is on migration. So uh, a migration tool to help with migration based on Scalafix, uh, migration helpers in the compilers themselves, and so on. Uh, focus is also currently on compiler performance. Uh, so we are focusing on correctness mostly. Now we are uh, working to make it a little bit faster. Uh, I think it's it's actually already quite quite plenty fast. So I get uh, on my setup on my MacBook Pro laptop. I get uh, when I run warm in SPT, I get about four thousand lines a second, which is I, I it's good enough for me, uh, in particular with incremental compilation. But uh, you, it's always nice to be faster. So uh, there's a performance gain going on. And then the biggest thing really is uh, tutorials, documentations, uh, 
these things, books, uh, web pages, migration guides, uh, videos. And that's probably the biggest share of efforts that we're working on right now. So who's working on that? So originally, Dottie was a project of my uh, lab at EPFL, which is called LAMP. Uh, in French, that means Laboratoire de Méthode de Programmation, or Programming Methods Laboratory. And you see there's a lot of Greek on the slides, if I blow that up. Um, so that's the more academic part, but we, we actually have been concentrating on really the hard tool tooling aspects and the compiler and all these things uh, that uh, so it's 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 not not just theory or it's predominantly practice and not theory really that comes out from there then the other big player and increasingly bigger and bigger player is scala center that uh, is now focused uh, primarily on scala 3 and the scala 3 migration so with everything that uh, with all the people in scala center that's basically the uh, the focus oh one other thing uh, that i should say now that i mentioned scala center another thing that's currently happening is supporting scala js to scala 3 and there again we're making very good progress so that's done under under the leadership of scala center with specifically set set to run Okay, so uh, Scala Center is brought to you by uh, an advisory board of companies, uh, so which you see here. But it's not just an advisory board. Quite a few of the companies are actually actively helping us by essentially uh, uh, giving us uh, very capable engineers to help with uh, tasks of uh, tooling and documentation and these things. So I want to give a shout out to the contributing members, which. Uh, here are Virtus Lab, uh, uh, 47 degrees, uh, light band, and um, you can't, can't quite see the last one. What was that? Lunatech. Sorry? Lunatech. 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 Yes, Lunatech. Great. Uh, and then there's also community organizations uh, like uh, uh, Type Level Scala uh, is committed to essentially porting the Type Level stack to Scala 3. And then finally, outside that is the large, larger Scala community. So there are lots and lots of people uh, uh, and project leaders that uh, have already ported their thing to Scala 3 that are uh, evangelizing for Scala 3. And I, I believe that's really the, the, the most important part of it, because without, without a community, all this would, would be uh, pointless. Uh, why would we even do that? But I, I see that. Uh, it's really rewarding to see the feedback that we get from the community and also the encouragement we get from the community and and the contributions. Okay, so uh, if you want to follow it, how can you stay informed? So there's uh, scalalang.org, uh, the, the website. Um, then uh, there's a Twitter, scalalang, uh, or uh, I, I tweet, but I don't tweet a lot, so Scala maybe follow both of them. Scala. Uh, if you want to get the news, certainly, then it's Scala Lang. Uh, there's Scala Contributors, which is the uh, forum, um, the Discord forum, this, uh, that uh, where we essentially discuss uh, uh, all the... Essentially, what happens on Contributors is we discuss uh, all the possible changes that we want to do to, to Scala 3 or the new developments. And uh, the Scala Center also has done a, a great job recently to keep everyone updated of essentially what the initiatives are, so what they uh, they are doing with the community, and what the status is, and things like that. So if you follow that, you will get essentially a a good um, uh, uh, overview of what is happening and what the progress is. Okay, so where to start? Uh, I think the, if you are uh, like most of you uh, working in Scala two then uh, I believe the best thing to get started is really this Scala free migration guide, uh, where you can just click on this and, uh, and that, that will essentially take you to the first steps to, uh, to, to, to get up to speed with Scala 3. Okay, so let me get switch back to... Uh, sorry? Best slide. This one, okay. Oh yeah, and, 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 and I should say, yeah, there's a... There's a blog uh, which essentially tells uh, everything that I told you, but in more detail, and and uh, uh, that that is essentially on the Scala Lang website uh, that you see here. Uh, I can go there. Um, here we see Scala Lang. 
So, so here we have the community powered release. That's the block uh, which essentially tells you what I just told you in more detail. Okay. So, so let me uh, go back to the other. Uh, Okay, so um, the uh, I can give you a quick rundown for those of you who uh, uh, are not completely up to date to say what's new in Scala three. So what what are the major things? And then I would propose I just take questions because I think I guess you will have a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer them. So I won't take the full forty five minutes, but maybe another ten minutes to just give you a quick rundown of that. Okay, so uh, I, I said that Scala 3 was sort of born to from the foundations that we worked on, and there were some things that changed, uh, it, some changes in the language to better connect with the foundations. Uh, so I think the most, uh, the, the first one was uh, the, the, the intersection types, which uh, are written with an ampersand and replace the width types, and also the union types. They, they really come from dot, the dependent object types calculus. Uh, then um, we have more uh, powerful function types, polymorphic function types, dependent function types, and the implicit function types, which come from essentially our work on, uh, on, on SI. <coughs> um, type lambdas and metaprogramming with quotes and splices. So these are things that are essentially heavy duty, uh, very foundational uh, things that are now much better connected to the underlying theory. Uh, the other uh, motto was to simplify life as a programmer. And there are a lot of sort of small simplifications that together make, make a big difference. Uh, so uh, for instance, you can now just write top level definitions, no, no, no need to uh, package your, your your definitions in objects or classes anymore. Top level will do. The enums to get essentially uh, class hierarchies, uh, case hierarchies done very quickly. Great for domain modeling where you have to define many types. The trait parameters uh, so they, that relieves you from having to choose between an abstract class or a trait. There are exports uh, which let you bundle functionality and essentially present that in in a facade like modules and uh, the new is has become optional so you can in, in the future just write uh, c uh, uh, with, uh, with 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 parents instead of new c so basically if, as far as creation is concerned every class is like a like a case class um, so all these things sort of uh, remove um, uh, complexity and, and make the language more regular and simpler to use for the programmer. The other is that we want to restrict unnecessary or unsafe features. Uh, so the, basically the, the motto here is re reduce code, unnecessary code variation and reduce uh, unsafety in execution. So um, uh, unnecessary code variation is that in the future we have decided that methods calls will always use dot unless you have you declare the method infix so that that means that the preferred method call syntax is that just the box standard regular syntax a dot method method name uh, open parents b instead of uh, writing the method name infix except of course if the method name is uh, symbol then you will write it infix or if you declare it infix then you also will will write it infix but not otherwise um, the <laughs> The uh, the uh, the other thing was uh, type projections were found to be unsound by our theoretical work, so that would be dropped. Uh, the pattern definitions and generators could fail previously silently. So, for instance, you could write well x colon colon xs equals ys, but if ys was the empty list, this would fail at one time. And uh, that's now uh, in 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 the future. This will be. Um, uh, this will require an unchecked annotation like you see here. Otherwise, it would be a type error. The similar case is for uh, four expressions where uh, you could have a filter uh, that, again, uh, an implicit filter in a pattern for a four expression. And that would filter. That means it would only pick the cases where uh, the pattern was applicable, which is actually a nice thing, but it's not always what you want. So in the future, 
uh, you can get the filtering behavior if you prefix the pattern with case because you say well that's just one of several cases i'm aware of that uh, so pick the one pick this case in your four expressions but if you don't write case then again it will be uh, strict so it, essentially it will check that the pattern or this uh, that, that you write is exhaustive that it basically can't be failed at runtime so these are sort of help us that tighten up the language a bit and avoid uh, unsafe behavior at runtime. Uh, there's also multiversal equality, which rules out nonsensical computations. So in the future, it will be very easy to have your types and to prevent e e equality between different of your library types that shouldn't be comparable, uh, which is a big help because, again, it's essentially the last remaining hole against fearless refactoring. So with multiversal equality, you can really essentially be fearless in refactoring because you know that the type checker will have your back. Uh, previously, that didn't apply for equality because, um, yeah, uh, you can compare everything with everything. So if you by introduce a, a type, uh, an, an error by your refactoring, then that might not be noticed at compile time. It might be a nonsensical runtime comparison. So that means a runtime comparison that always gives gives false, which is of course something which is not not nice because it's much harder to find and debug than just a type error that you fix on the fly. Okay, then there are uh, quite a few replacements where we do things in a different way. Uh, we 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 don't really need package objects more. We have exports and top level defs. We have the new scheme of givens for the zoo of implicit definitions that we had before. Uh, we have extension methods, which is a really nice feature. I'm using it uh, more and more, and then, uh, and I now I, I don't really know how how I could ever have lived without them. Uh, previously, we had implicit classes; they are much clunkier for the same functionality. Uh, and we have a completely revamped and more streamlined meta programming story with inline staging and match types instead of the current macros, which were. Uh, the, let's say they're very expressive, they were scarily expressive. Uh, you could do a lot of things with them, but you could also shoot yourself in the foot really, really easy. Okay. Um, so there are essentially these things, new new foundations of metaprogramming, uh, inline scores and splices, uh, new way to express term inference. So the new motto is given a type T, generate a canonical value for that type, and that replaces implicits. Uh, I can show you uh, a little bit what that looks like. So here you have your standard example that you used implicit for, uh, ORT, and uh, that uh, is essentially the new way to, to write these things where you don't need implicit anymore, but you write givens. Uh, here's, let, let me just skip ahead because I'm pretty much out of time. So um, you have optional braces. Uh, so curly braces and parentheses will be optional in a lot more places. And instead of braces, you can use indented blocks. Uh, and you have a nice and uh, quiet control syntax that doesn't re rely on a lot of parents and braces. So the question is, is Scala 3 a new language? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, in a sense, yes. It has many language changes. Some features are removed. Uh, there's new constructs to improve the user experience and onboarding. And the books are about to be rewritten. They, they not just will, will have to be rewritten, they are rewritten right now as we speak. On the other hand, it's still recognizably Scala. All core constructs uh, st stay in place and there's a large and practical common subset between Scala 2 and, and 3. Programs can cross-build. There are many versions of programs that uh, are released by now for both Scala 2 and Scala 3. Uh, I think the real answer is it's a process. So the changes that I've given you so far are really not going to be phased in all at once, which means that Scala 3.0 that we have will have everything that I talked about. It will be available. But it won't be the things that are slated to be removed won't be removed immediately. Uh, we can't remove them immediately because we want to be able to cross build between two two thirteen and three zero. So if we would remove a lot of things from Scala, then the cross build subset would be very small. So these will be removed uh, over time in the coming releases, and so that's that's a process, of course. 
That means some constructs will be deprecated and phased out in th in the 3.x release train. That means that for 3.0, we will have some temporary duplications. There will be ways to do it uh, the old way, the Scala 2 way, and the new way, the Scala 3 way. But I hope the end result will be a more compact and regular language. So um, Josh Jureth, uh, uh, he, he uh, tried out Scala 3 and he said, TLDR, Scala 3 will be amazing. It's very much a new experience and very much the still Scala. And that's basically the motto that we want to shoot for. So we get some criticism. Why, why so many features at once? Couldn't you have done it grad gradually over time? Well, the main problem is really this books will be rewritten aspect. Book authors uh, and MOOC authors, of which I am one myself, they take don't take well to say to 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 if if you you just have written your book and then uh, the language people designers come and say oh yeah yeah but unfortunately it's out of date you can't you you have to write it again or you have to change it again that's not a pleasure ple pleasant experience and for MOOCs it's even worse because you have to do the recording from the start so uh, that means that we have to do sort of a big jump scenario because once we are committed that books will be rewritten, we have to get changes in now if they affect the foundations, if they simplify life, especially for learners, because you don't want to teach a, a more complex way way of doing things only to come out with a with an easier way next year, and if it replaces existing features, because otherwise again uh, the, the the new materials would be outdated very quickly. So that means we have really tried to prioritize foundations, simplifications, and restrictions for this release. So where we needed foundations, we put it in. Where we where it simplified life for developers, we put it in. Where we thought we had to put in a restriction, that has to be done, uh, done now. There were quite a few of other worthwhile <coughs> possible additions that basically added power and expressiveness for expert users. And these essentially got all delayed because we said we had too much already and these can wait because essentially they don't uh, affect this books have been have to have to be rewritten criterion. Good. So that's all I had. Thank you. You can try it out still today for a limited time under .epfl.ch. It will migrate soon to the Scala organization. So try it under Dottie while it lasts. Thank you.